Hi everyone, this is Steph from Student CRM and I'm joined by Andy S. Hi everyone. In this session, we're going to be looking at Webform Builder again. So this is the second part of two parts of training on Webform Builder. And this session, we're going to be looking more specifically at how to actually build forms and add fields um, and build your forms so that you can get the best data from your students. So um, I'm on the dashboard again of New Forest University, our demo university. And I'm going to start by clicking into the Webform Builder app, just like this. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just show you in a quick form, just like quickly a, a brand new form, how you can get different fields for different apps. So just quickly go in and edit this one, which is, this is a draft for web form, so it's never been published before. And I've just quickly put in my name and um, a tag on this side. But on the configuration, so on bus stop two, this is where we decide where, um, or rather what type of form we're building, so for what app, and then where that data is stored. So at the moment, I've got this set up as a rapid response form going into um, a domestic inquiries occurrence. And then on bus stop three, which is the, bu the builder and where you see where your form fields are drawn from, you'll see that all of the fields on here are for rapid response. And then underneath you've got a student database. So that's rapid response fields and student database fields. But if I skip back to configuration, bus stop two, and I change that rapid response to mobile event capture and save that. And you'll see when I go back to the builder, I have mobile event capture fields and student database fields. So actually you've got the opportunity there to select the different um, apps that you want to send data in, and then it'll give you the appropriate fields for that particular app. Okay, so that's a really, quick and easy way of um, knowing what, what form it is that you're building, because it'll have the, the three letter acronym for that particular um, app in the form fields when you come to uh, add them in. Um, today though, I'm going to um, build a prospectus request form. Um, so you've got the choice of four different apps. You've got mobile event capture, prospectus requests, rapid response and surveys. Um, but today I'm going to pick on prospectus requests because that's got a nice sort of gen general um, overview of the different types of fields that can be added. So I'm going to build a prospectus request one and I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to choose one that I've actually created from a clone. So there's a little bit of um, work that's already been done for me in this one. As I mentioned in the previous video, any form that you like that you have already created can be cloned and created into a new form. So it's really um, a quick way of, of getting started on your forms. So I've cheated and I've made this form already cloned from a previous form. So you'll see that the, the details on uh, step one about have already been filled in. So we've got the name of it and the description. And then on, if I click next and go to configuration, you'll see that it's a prospectus request form and the, uh, the data is being stored in prospectus requests. Um, actually, I've just noticed here that I'm, I'm editing it in another window. So I'm just gonna take control now. This is actually a really useful feature. So another user has actually already started editing this. It's actually one of my other logins. Um, but when I take control, I lock that other person out and I take control of it. So that's actually a really nice little feature to show you there. So now I've got control so I can make changes to it. Um, a little extra um, facility which might be useful is when you do clone a form, if you're cloning from one app to another, so for instance, if you've got a rapid response form that you want to change into a prospectus request form or a mo mobile event capture form, you can actually do that. Uh, but when you select here and you change it to another app, what it will do is any of the existing fields that you've built for that app will actually be um, uh, removed from the form and you'll just have access to the new apps fields. So if I change from prospectus request to rapid response, then the prospectus request fields that I've already added will be removed from my builder, but that's all good. It does give you an opportunity to, to sort of clone between apps if you, if you want to. So this is a prospectus request form, which is going into the domestic prospectus requests occurrence. Um, I haven't got any notifications set up and I've got my GDPR details and tracking already in there, um, which is fine. I'm just going to save my changes and then move on to net 
next bus stop, which is number three, which is the builder. And this is what we're going to be talking about mostly today. So the builder has um, two parts. Um, you've got your sort of your store of fields over on the left hand side. And then on the right, you've got the fields that are actually going to be on your form. And you can see at the moment, I've got an image, a text block, a spacer. I've got a box top and a box bottom. And then all my actual data capture fields are in the middle there. And then obviously I've got a consent block, which is for obviously your GDPR consent, and then your submit button, which is at the bottom. So that's the form that's already sort of been cloned from the previous one. If I just go to preview, you can see what that looks like. So image, spacer, text box with the, all your perspectives today in it. And then you've got a um, box top and bottom, which is basically just the container for the fields. And then all my fields are actually within that. And then at the bottom there, you've got consent, the consent block, and then you've got submit. So you can see how the green fields on the builder form relate back to the actual different parts of the form that you're constructing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to show you how you can sort of find fields on the left and then drag those in. So at the moment, we've got um, a few different types of different fields. And this drop down here allows you to filter between those. So the item types that we've got are fields, and those are the actual items that capture data. Items, which are slightly different types of things. So we've got things like boxes, which I've told you about, which is the container that contains my data capture fields. We've got images, which was the header image that I had on the top of that. Our private notes. Now, private notes is a useful one. Um, basically, that allows you to put something in your um, green form, your form builder here, which doesn't show on your real life form at all. So I might put a little private note in here above my consent block. And basically, I'm just going to say this consent is draft is uh, draft purposes only. So this is basically saying, I don't know what consent needs to go on this form, but I'm going to leave myself a little note so that I remember that I need to change that consent block to something else in the future. So that's a good little private note system. And you can use that anywhere in your builder. So you can put private notes above any of your different fields to leave yourself a little bit of a reminder or just to give yourself some more space. It may be if you're building a very big form and sometimes your application forms, um, which is a, something that we'll be um, adding in the future, and your survey forms um, can be very long and you might need the private note feature just to give yourself a bit of visual space in the form that you're building. Uh, but I'm just gonna drag that back out again, just for now. So anytime you put a form field in or an item or anything at all, you can drag it back out again just by grabbing it like this and then popping it back over there. And that actually makes that disappear. Um, so that's a great way of, of uh, basically just quickly grabbing things out of the form and, and throwing them back into the pot again. So uh, private note, yep, as I said, is just private notes that you can write and put on your form, which don't show to the students. Spacer, now spacer is basically a box which um, allows you to just create some white space. You can also put lines in as well. So if I just click into spacer, that the one that's already on there, you can see that this is a um, 10 pixel space, white space, with no lines whatsoever. I can actually add lines. So if I add a one pixel line and just apply that and then go to preview and scroll down, you can see I've added a one pixel line, which actually looks fairly terrible. So I'll probably take that out again, but that's what Spacer does. I'm just going to go back in just to take that out again. Okay, gone. So just continuing on with um, items. Um, the next item is video. Now video is where you can basically insert any video you like. Um, it usually has to be hosted on Vimeo or YouTube, something like that. You basically put the URL in there and then you can have a hosted video on your form as well. So, which is a really um, lovely way of perhaps giving an introduction to a survey or telling students a little bit more about this form information that you're asking for on the form. So yeah, you can add video items too. And then the third type is blocks. Blocks is basically um, 
types of um, questions that you can ask. One is a signpost. Now a signpost item um, allows you to actually redirect people to different forms. Um, so it's quite, a, quite a, um, a, a sophisticated feature actually. So if you're building several different forms, you can actually ask a signpost question at the top of it and redirect them to a different form on a different part of your web, of your, um, uh, web of your website or you can um, get them to continue on this form. So a really practical use of that would be if you were, um, if you had two forms for prospective requests, one for domestic and one for international, you could actually redirect people who are on the wrong form to your domestic um, prospectus requests or your international prospectus request form. So the signpost uh, feature is really useful like that. And then text block is something which is just basically exactly as it says on the tin, it's a text block. So you've got basic WYSIWYG tool here and you can just pop in any text you want to in that particular block and center it and do some formatting on it, add some links as well. So text blocks is uh, really useful. Okay, um, but obviously the primary thing that you're gonna want on your form are fields. So these are the fields that are available to add to a prospectus request form. Um, you've got things like current school, you've got a lot of custom fields, things like inquiry source, packing code, um, and then you've got student fields as well, which includes things like date of birth, ethnicity, gender, nationality, uh, postcode, etc. cetera. Um, a lot of these fields are actually already on our form. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna pop into each of the elements that we've already got on our form and just show you how you can um, change the settings on these um, and make sort of uh, variations to how these appear on your form itself. So um, image, at the moment, we've just got a nice little um, header image for New Forest University. To change that, you just click here um, to upload from your desktop or you drag and drop files in there, no problem at all. You can change the alignment and you can obviously add in um, various bits of um, alt text, etc. cetera. Um, you can also, and this is the, the case for any field, you can choose when this displays on a form. So you can actually decide, hey, this particular image will only display when it matches certain conditions, okay? Um, and then those conditions could be when um, any of the other items are answered to in a particular way. So for instance, in this case, I could say, I only want that image to show when the student's first name is in a particular value, or I only want it to show when the delivery method is P, which is postal. So you can actually choose when a field appears on your forms. So it's a really clever way of having conditional questions. So the first question would be, do you want us to get in contact with you about your inquiry? And the answer might be yes or no. And then if the answer is yes, then the next field that comes up is great. How, what's the best method of getting in contact with you? So you can have conditional questions. So this is a really, um, a sophisticated advanced feature, which allows you to link one question to the previous answer of another question. Um, so it's quite a cool thing to do. Um, I won't go into all the detail of how that works in this particular video, but um, that kind of um, question can be answered in a support call, or we can do a separate session on conditionals if you would like us to go into that. And we will definitely be talking a lot more about conditionals in our surveys training video. Okay, so that's the options in uh, image. The next item down is our text block. And as I showed you before, that's a really basic one. So basically you've just got the um, formatting of your text. And again, you can choose whether that shows or not, which is quite useful in things like surveys. Um, and you can just change the, the text and, and do a few little bits with like alignment and adding in a link if you want to, that kind of thing. So that's quite a simple one. I already showed you spacer. Now box, boxes are quite useful. Boxes are used to provide a bit of um, visual separation between um, various parts of your form. Um, in this particular case, obviously we've got a nice little blue gray box. Um, and in the settings, you can change the label. I don't, the label is basically just what you wanna call it. It doesn't appear anywhere on the form itself. It's just a internal admin. You can have rounded corners. So if I just show you in the preview here, you can see what your um, actual box is going to look like. So I can change it to much more rounded corners. 
I can change it back to sort of square corners. So you can actually do a little bit of adjustment of the styling of box there. Um, you can change the box border color. And at the moment I've got that as blue and then the box fill color you can change as well. And those are hexadecimal codes. So you can find those anywhere and, and make changes. And if you click, you can actually just select from here. So if I wanted to, I could make it a bit more towards the gray slightly, a little bit paler, then apply that. Okay, and then when I go back into that box label again, you'll see that the change has been it's made to slightly lighter blue. Um, so the changes to a box label apply to the bottom and the top. So um, basically when I click into the bottom, the settings are done in the top. So all the settings for that particular box are in here. And of course I can move that box up and down using the drag and drop. I can basically say, okay, now actually I want the bottom of that box to be after the mobile number. And that will then change on my preview form. So you'll see now that my box only contains the four fields. That's quite cool. And then everything else is down below there. All right, back to the builder. And I'm just gonna move my box label back again. Um, you might have already noticed that um, the ordering of your fields is com completely controlled by dragging and dropping. You can change the order of any of these. You can pop mobile above email address or um, email above mobile very easily just by dragging and dropping. Every time I make a change, you'll see at the top there, it said auto save. I'll just show you that again. So every change that you make on this builder, there's no save button that you need to click down the bottom. It'll just auto save every time you make any adjustments. So changing the, the order of fields, there's no save button. It just does it instantly for you. I'll put that back again. Steph, when yes. ordering the, the buttons, are there any that specifically have to be in a, in a specific position? Mm. Absolutely right. Um, as you might um, obviously guess, the submit button really does need to be the last one on there. <laughs> it does allow you to drag it around, but from a practical point of view, you must always have your submit button as the last item on the list. Um, you'll also notice that there are some locked fields. In 99% of cases, your form must always have first name, last name, and email address, and a submit button. Those are the minimum fields required for data capture. The only um, exception to that would be an anonymous survey, which doesn't have first name, last name, or email address on it, and just has a submit button. But you will always have a submit button on there. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, that answers the question. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. OK. Um, but other than that, you can pretty much have your, your um, fields in any particular order you want to. That's no problem at all. Um, with prospectus request, you need you do um, need to have your prospectus request delivery method above your address block, and I'll show you why in a second. Uh, but other than that, yeah, pretty much you can have them in, in the whatever order makes sense for um, a logical form. So I'm going to start going into the individual um, data capture fields here now and show you a little bit about the things that you can change in them. First name is a really good example because basically that's a pretty simple text based capture. And it gives you an example of how you can change fields. So at the top, again, you've got a preview of roughly what that um, field is going to look like on your form. And you'll see that we've got quite a few elements. We've got this first thing here, which is actually called the label. And that is the question that you're asking. So this is a first name. So it's capturing data into the student database first name field. But the label, which is what appears on the form, can be whatever you like whatever makes sense. At the moment, I've got, hey, what's your first name? I might want to make that slightly less um, chirpy and say something like, and make, make it a bit more formal and just have a full first name like that. And you'll see that changes up the top straight away. So that's the label or the, the, the actual display question that you get. We would also have something called a placeholder, which is the text which appears actually in the in the box itself. And when you click into that, that disappears on the form. But it's a nice, helpful bit of text, which gives like an example, for instance. But you don't have to have that. Um, you can change it to something like. Um,
like that. And you've also got a third item called help text, help message rather, and that appears underneath the field. Now, if you want a clean form, you might decide you don't want that. So you can actually just delete it like that and save it without. So I'm going to clean up my form a little bit and I'm going to remove that bit of help text. Um, and then I've got the option, you'll see this little asterisk next to it. Now that says that this is required. And yes, first name is always required on a form. So we're going to say, yes, it's required. And then the message that shows, if somebody tries to submit this form without putting their first name in, the required message will pop up in red. And this is what the, the message currently is. Your first name is a required field for this form. And that will show underneath that field. So you can change that. And I can say something like, please, can we have your first name? So that's a, a little bit of a change I've made. So now when I'm happy that this is the field um, options that I want for first name, I'm just gonna say apply. And then that will now be available on the preview. So if I just go to the preview, you can now see that I've got first name and then I've removed a little bit of help text underneath and I've changed the placeholder text as well. And then when I try and submit this, you'll see that the, all the fields which I haven't filled in have gone red and you'll see that my required help message, uh, required message has changed to please can we have your first name. So you see how that happens straight away on the preview. So go back to the builder again. So I can go down through these fields and I can make different changes to them. So the second one I'm going to go to is last name. And again, just to repeat what I showed you before, I'm going to change this to just surname. And I'm going to get rid of the help text. And again, yes, it's already required. So I'll just apply that. And then the third one I'm going to do is email address. Again, these are all required fields, so you have to have them. So it's actually quite easy to decide what you want on there. And again, I'll make that a bit formal. Email. I'm going to get rid of the help message. And then, yeah, that required message is all OK. And I'm going to save that. So now we've cleaned up those three fields a little bit and made them a bit more formal. Okay, so the next one we're coming to is not a locked field and that's the mobile number. So I can actually say, you know what? I don't actually wanna capture the student's mobile number. I don't think I need that on my particular form. And it may be that actually there's certain things that you think by capturing that's gonna create friction. So if in this particular case, maybe I, I know I'm not gonna be capturing, I'm not gonna be contacting people by mobile. Um, I might wanna take it off. However, if I know that I'm going to be sending, for instance, SMS campaigns, or I'm going to be sending SMS touch points, then I want, might want to actually capture that mobile number for sure. So the thing that I can do is I can say, all right, um, for the moment, actually, this has already been set up and it's already on there. So I can actually temporarily hide it. So if I want to make that decision later, I can click on, you'll see this little eye icon, I can just click on that and that will actually hide it on the form. So if I go and have a look at my form now, you'll see that the mobile number has disappeared and it's no longer there. If later on down the track, I change my mind and go, actually, no, I do want the mobile number. That's, that was silly for me to even think that I don't want it. Unclick the eye and then it shows it again. So that's the hide show facility. And that's really useful for when you're experimenting with your form and you want to see what it looks like. If I want to definitely get rid of something, now I'm sh sure that I don't want that anymore, then actually I just drag that field away and put it back into my pot again. That will remove all of the settings. So any um, settings that I've made, any changes to the text that I've made will be removed and that, that field will be discarded and put back into the pot again. If I then want to then add it again, I'll need to start from afresh with my settings. So just be careful when you're dragging things back into the pot again, that you're definitely done with it and you're happy for the settings to be removed. Um, but that's how you sort of move things backwards and forwards. So um, I am going to leave my mobile number on there, actually, thinking about it. It's probably quite useful to have. Um, but I am going to remove that help text. The whole help message. Um, and I am going to keep this mobile number. Um, and I'm going to make it required. I definitely want to get that mobile number. Click OK. 
Again, you'll notice, um, just going back in there, that I've got the ability to add this as a conditional question. So it, I could decide I don't want to show this question in a particular set of circumstances based on previous questions in the survey, okay, uh, in, the, um, in the form. Right, the next one I am going to look at is delivery method. Now, delivery method is a specific form just for prospectus requests. And you can tell that if I just go back, but the fact it's got PRQ next to it. So this isn't a student database field. This is a prospectus request field, and it's specifically for prospectus requests. And this one is how do I want to receive my prospectus? Is it by post, download, or both? And again, I've got lots of um, options here. And how to I can because this is this is actually a radio button question. You'll see that I've got radio buttons here, and I've got lots of options here and how I can actually change those. So I can say, do I want this hidden? Now hidden means that this value will be passed through the form without ever being shown to the student. So for instance, if I don't offer post postal prospectuses, I want to hide this question and always submit it as download. So that's actually an option that you can have. There's no point having download as an option on there if it's always going to be download. So I can actually say, pass this hidden value as download if I want to. Um, but I'm not going to hide it today. I'm going to have it shown because I want my students to see. And I want them to be able to select from post download or both. Now I can change the orientation of it. So I can go, hey, I'm going to actually have them vertical um, or I can have them horizontal. And in fact, I do want the vertical today. So I'm going to leave them as vertical. Again, just like the other fields, I can change the delivery, I can change the label. So I can say, changes to how would you like to receive your prospectus? I have that on there as well. I've already got rid of the help message, so that's fine. So again, I can say, is this required? And in this, this particular case, yeah, I definitely wanna know how you wanna receive your prospectus. So I'm gonna leave that as required. I'm just gonna apply that. Okay, so that's the delivery method. Now we're getting on to some slightly more uh, sophisticated fields. So we've got something here called the student database address block, and we've also got the academic block as well. So let's have a look at address block. Now address block has quite a few different items in it. Now, some of these blocks have more than one field. This one called address block has quite a few in it. Now you get to decide how much detail you want to collect from your students. It may be that actually you don't need every single little bit of their address. For instance, address line three, that, that is such a rare option. It may be that you decide you actually want to say, no, that's not active. And you get the option in these address block fields to actually make a lot of changes. So I'm now just hidden address line two, address line three rather, so it no longer appears. So let me just work down this with you. Like other fields, you get the option to display on the form. So you can say, when is this address block shown? So in this particular case, this will only show when um, obviously the postal option is selected. You can use the address finder. Um, now an address finder is basically a postcode lookup. You'll see here it's got enter postcode first, and that basically allows um, you to use um, a service called a postcode address finder, and you can decide whether to turn that on or off. Obviously, most of the case times, you're gonna to wanna to have that on. So if you choose yes, and you choose whether it's UK and overseas, if this is a domestic form, so it's only really for local students, so I'm just gonna choose UK only. If you wanna know a little bit more about that, just click on the what's this for button. And then I can decide which of these fields at the top here, and I've got lots of them are active. Now, I've already decided I don't want um, address line three. I think that's a surplus to my requirements. I'm also going to hide county. Nobody collects county anymore. So I'm going to turn county off. Oh, and now that's gone. And again, you can change these labels and you can change these placeholders as much as you want to. I'm not going to leave those for now, but you can make adjustments to those, um, how that visually appears on all of it. So you can see I've turned county off, postcode is active, country is active. And then I've got a help message, which I'm just going to take away. And then again, we definitely want the required um, address. So we're going to leave that as applied. Now, if I go back to my preview again, and you're bouncing around a lot here, you can see that my um, address field, if I do post, you'll see that pops up. 
and you'll see that I've got rid of the address line three and I've got rid of county as well. So we've got a much shorter um, address line here, which is much better. And you can see that's where you also do the uh, postcode lookup. So if I look up um, postcode, you'll see that it brings up all the different available addresses at that particular postcode. Okay, right. I'm getting through, getting through. How are you going, Andy? Yeah, going good. Uh, all making sense at the moment, thanks. Brilliant, brilliant, great. Uh, okay, so that's the address block. Um, the next one I'm gonna show you is the academic block. Now this is a really important one and it's gonna be on most of your data capture forms. So if I just click in and show you what it, what it basically does. Now at the moment, it's capturing level of study, subject and course. Now these are items which are taken from your courses app. And this is where you basically decide, uh, allow your student to tell you what they're interested in. Academic block would be on nearly all of your forms and it is quite flexible. So you can decide how much of this information you wish to capture. You've got all of these different options. You've got year of entry, level of study, campus, subject, course and intake all of which is available in the courses app. And you can decide how much of that you want to capture. At the moment, I've got level of study, subject and course, but it might be that I want to add in something else. So I might decide I actually want to add in um, intake as well. So I'm going to add intake. And I just make that active. Again, I've got the little options of labels and placeholders, and I can decide whether that's um, required or not. And then when I add that, I'm say, yep, that's what I want. And you can see that, that the intake will then be available as an option too. So in each of these settings, we've got various different, um, so I definitely need, actually, I don't know why I haven't got year of entry on there. So at the moment, this has been set up as a hidden value, which is useful. So 2021 will always be passed as the year of entry that this form is for which is quite useful. But in my case, I have decided I don't want that. I don't want it to be hidden. So year of entry is now appears in my form. And I have decided that from the available years of entry, I want them to be able to select 2022, 2023 alone. So I'm just gonna give them two options, which is 2022 and 2022. And when I'm happy with that, yeah, I'm just gonna get rid of the uh, help message as well. Year of entry, placeholder, yep. So I'm happy with that. I've got the two options and I'm just going to apply that and then just go back. Oops, I just closed it. And you'll see that I've got 2022 and 2023 there now as my options. Um, and then subjects. So subjects I don't want to capture today. So I'm just going to actually close that. And I'm going to say, no, I don't want subjects and turn that off. That gets rid of subject as well. So now we've got year of entry, level of study, course, and intake. So I've got four different options on there. Um, anytime I want to, I can go back in and I can unhide or activate any of these fields. Um, so it allows me to have a really good understanding of what the student's about without having too much burden on them to capture too much information. Okay, let's apply that. And now that will be on my form. Um, actually, when you're building forms, you might find it useful to actually have this in another window. So rather than flipping between um, Builder Step 3 and Builder Step 5, it might be useful for you to actually use the web form preview in a new window. And so just open that up there. And that might make it a bit easier to sort of flip between them. Um, and actually, you can see now that I've got my academic block on there. So it allows me to choose the of entry, the level of study I'm interested in, and then the courses and then intake that I'm useful. One thing I will show you actually, which is quite important, is um, so when you're selecting levels of study, um, you can actually um, reduce those. Again, so I've got quite a lot of levels of study on there. I might decide I actually only want this to be an undergraduate form. So if I go back to the builder again, and go into academic block, and then go to level of study, I can actually turn off some of those and say, no, I don't want those anymore and only have my undergraduate ones. Um, you can also do that um, in things like campus and, and also in subject too. So if I go into just turn subject back on again, 
you'll see that I can actually select subjects or I can use something called smart subjects. Now smart subjects actually intelligently select the subjects which are available based on the courses which are published. And that's probably the best option actually is to always have your smart subjects on. Um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll leave subjects on now actually. And then in courses as well, um, you've got the option of restricting your courses list based on tags. So if you've got um, course tags on your courses, you can actually say, I only want to filter those down using the course tags that I've chosen. So you can actually restrict the number of courses that you're shown. That might be useful if you're publishing a single faculty form, which you only want like a, a limited number of courses to appear on. So let's just apply that now. Switch into my other window and just refresh that. And then you'll see that subject is now back on there. So now we've got a really full academic block and I can select. Um, so subject filters down the list and gives me art and design. And then I can choose a course from that. I'm going to go fine art and then an intake, which is in this case, always September, 2022. There we go. So that's the academic block. How's that sounding, Andy? Yeah, it all makes complete sense. I had a question about that and then you answered it for me. Oh, brilliant. Which one was that? <laughs> about how the how the subjects work with uh selecting years of entry and levels of study so that answers it perfectly brilliant brilliant great okay so there we go we've got um i've got quite a a, a typical prospectus request form being built there so and i'm just going to talk a little bit about um the obviously i've talked about box labels and bottoms so the consent block, now the consent block is just um, where the actual consent and topics show. So you actually select which consent and topic in the configuration bus stop to. But um, this is the block part. So basically this just allows you to position your consent block in the right place. Um, and again, you can decide that you don't want to capture consent for some reason um, by hiding it just by clicking on the little eye icon. Um, the next thing is the submit button. Now, the submit button actually does have some options on it. You might think it's quite a simple thing, but you can actually decide um, what you want that submit button to look like. So I don't like the word submit. So I'm going to change that to um, just call, I'm going to change that to request my prospectus. There you go. And I can change the size of the button, make it bigger, or I can make it smaller. I'm going to leave it nice and big. And I can also make it a round or square. So I'm going to make it a bit squarer, just like that. You'll see up here how it changes shape. Now, one of the things that we always get asked is how do I change the thank you message after somebody submits the form? Well, it's in the submit button. Okay, that's a very important one. So when you are changing the settings for your submit button, that is where you add the text for your thank you page. And in this case, I've got New Forest University and something quite generic like thank you for submitting the form. And I'll change that to thank you for requesting your prospectus. It'll be with you shortly. And I've also got the options of then doing a redirect. So if I, after the form was submitted, actually wanted to re redirect these people to a different part of my website, I can actually do that. So I can say after three seconds, I want you to go to my university website and you just pop the URL in there. And you've also got the option to replace it in the current tab or view inside iframe in the current tab. So we've got lots of options there for changing the redirect, but I'm not gonna redirect, I'm gonna leave them where they are at the moment and apply. Okay, so going back to my form, refreshing again, you can see now that my buttons are a little bit um, more square. Actually, I've noticed that it doesn't change that because that's actually controlled by the CSS theme that I've got applied. So I'll show you and remind you about CSS themes in a, in a moment. Um, but yeah, I'm quite happy with my form now. I think I've got all the bits I need on there. Um, but let me just go back and show you some of the other options you've got. So let's just have a look at the field options for prospectus request. You have got some other things on here, like uh, date of birth, ethnicity, gender, nationality. So you can actually add some other things on there. Um, a packing code, for instance, you might say, what's a packing code? Well, that's actually probably going to be a hidden value that you pass through into the prospectus request, which actually has a little bit of instruction on it for your, your um, uh, mailing house. So packing code can be added as a hidden value. It wouldn't be something that you would show to your students, but they can be passed through. 
And you can also do that with something like um, personas, for instance. So if you want a persona attached to everybody who fills in this field, you can add the persona field in there and then actually that will come in as a hidden value or you can add it as a, a, um, a question that then adds a persona to the student record. So you've got lots of different types of fields. I can't possibly go into every single field at the moment. So I'm just going to say that um, anything you want to know about any of any of the specific settings for particular types of fields, please get in touch with support. And we're very happy to answer questions about those. But a lot of the time it's quite self explanatory. So if you're experimenting, you can just drag in a field like date of birth, for instance, and pop that in there, and then go into settings and go, okay, I can see this is the kind of options I've got. I can change the available date range. Um, I can change bits and pieces like the label, et cetera. And that shows you the options that you've got. And that's really a quick way of experimenting with the, with the fields on the form. And I can just pop it back in again. So yeah, yeah I don't want that one. Um, okay, so those are the Steph, sort of standard fields. Yep. Have interest. Uh, I'd see there you've got custom varchar one, two, three, four, five. Can mm -hmm. you just talk about those for a second if that's possible? Oh, yeah, brilliant. Okay, yeah, that's where I was going next. So custom fields. Um, custom fields are available on most forms. Um, and if they're available, you'll see them here in your little um, holding place. Um, and they let you add custom values to your form. So if something is not available in this list, for instance, perhaps you want to capture some information um, that's very specific to your university and which doesn't isn't generically covered in either a prospectus request or a student database field or whatever other app you're using, you can actually create a custom field. Now you've got things, you've got different types of custom fields. You've got dates, so that's the ca capture a custom date that might be um, when are you interested in us contacting you, for instance, that might be um, a custom date field. Um, you've got custom int, and that's a number. So that might be how many friends are you going to be bringing to the event? So maybe there's 10 or whatever. Then you've got more generic ones. Custom text is a, a large text field. And then custom bar cards are basically just text fields, and they're very, um, very flexible indeed. So I'm just going to use a custom bar card here. And I'm going to add that to my form. Uh, I'm going to add it just at the bottom there. And then I'm going to ask a very simple question. So basically, I'm going to ask, and I just change the label here. I'm going to be asking, why do you want a prospectus? Quite a generic question. And then I'm going to capture the values here. So I'm going to say, just select your reason. And then I'm going to chew, add some reasons in. So I'm going to say, I like pretty pictures. I want to read more. You'll see. But that will then be added in as why do you want to capture what why do you want to prospect us and i'm just going to remove the other option as well so in in a lot of these um questions you do have the option to cover other but in my case i'm going to take other off because i don't want other as another reason and the field type that i'm going to have you can select different field types so i can say this is a drop down but i could change it to uh, radio buttons instead um, or check boxes, but I'm going to stick with drop down for now. And the field title. Now, this is quite important with a custom field. When I select what this field is called, because at the moment it's called custom varkar one. When I change this and lock it, it's locked forever. So I'm going to add it onto my field, and this is always going to be prospectus reason. So for this particular occurrence of prospectus requests. Custom Varkar 1 is forever now going to be prospectus reason. And I won't be able to change that once I've used up that particular field. Obviously, I've got lots of other ones. You know, I've got Custom Varkar 2, 3, 4, and 5, which I can use for different purposes. But when I set this up and I lock this onto my form, it will forever be prospectus request, prospectus reason. 
And the reason why you don't want to change that in future is because once you start capturing data in that field, the purpose has been locked and you don't want to in the future then start putting different stuff in there. So we're going to leave this as prospectus reason and that's then going to be locked. So once I click apply and I just, um, this is not a required question, so get rid of that a required message. That then adds to my form and I'm just going to refresh that and you'll see that that's now been added other pages that I want to read more at the bottom. And you'll see um, that this has now got the name prospectus reason and that's now locked and that's there forever. So even if I decide in the future, I don't want that on there anymore and I drag it over to the right, uh, sorry, to the left, it'll always be locked still as prospectus reason and I won't be able to change it again. So that's uh, custom fields and that's the same um, basic process for all the different types of custom fields. You, really, you get a maximum of, I think it's 10 prospectus uh, or custom bar cars rather, or custom fields. Um, and it's the number varies slightly depending on forms, but um, most of the time it's 10. Um, and that's, we found that's quite enough for most people, uh, but you can add as many of those as you want to your form. Does that explain uh, custom fields? Yeah, it does. Thanks, Steph. Um, just on that 10 figure, is that 10 for this app or this occurrence or how does that break down? That's per occurrence, yeah. So you can use it. If you've got three occurrences of prospectus requests, then there'll be a total of 30 custom fields that you can use. Thank you, that's really clear, thanks. Brilliant, okay, okay. So that is basically all about um, the fields. Um, right, I think I've covered most of the basics of how fields work. And there's a couple of little things on the builder page that I still want to cover. Up the top here, you've got a settings cog. And if you click on that settings cog, you can change the title of the page. Now the title of the page is probably only important if you're going to be um, not embedding it. If you embed your form, then the title of the page doesn't really matter. But if you are gonna be opening this form in its own window, then you probably wanna change that to something like prospectus requests or in a few. Um, so, and you can also change the favicon as well. So at the moment we use our little Serum one, I'm just gonna leave it as that, but that's where you would put your own university favicon into. Did you have a question, Andy? I did, yeah. So that name gets generated when the form gets created? That's exactly right. So to start off with, it'll just be the name of the form. Um, and obviously whatever name you've given it internally. So if you are gonna be publishing this um, live so that the, it's, the form is not embedded and it's actually gonna be opening in a tab, then you make, want to make sure you change that so that it's um, a public, public facing name, basically. I'm just gonna apply that now. And what happens when I clone a form, Steph? Okay, so when you clone a form, uh, it'll actually copy over the name. So that's one of the things that you need to remember to do is actually go in and click on the little cog and change it to match the new, the new name that you want to give it. That makes sense. Thanks. Cool. Lovely. Okay. So now I'm going to go back to um, our preview page. Okay. So this is basically um, when we're previewing, every time we make a change and click that save button, it actually shows here. You'll see that um, at the moment I've got a particular styling on here. If I want to change the styling, and we, we talked a little bit about this in the previous video, I can actually apply CSS. So at the moment I've got this as the Cosmo theme. And if I want to change that back to um, the sort of look and feel, this, this does affect all of the way that the, the form appears um, to a greater or lesser degree. So button appearance, the color of the buttons, all that kind of thing that you want to change, this is all done in the CSS theme. So I want to change mine back to default. And I'm just going to save that. And then refresh. And you'll see now that the styling of the text and the button styling has completely changed. And that's now a nice clear button instead. If you want to add custom themes, you can do. There is the option to add down the bottom, um, also rather up the top, you can press plus and you can add, create a new custom theme and add your own CSS. And that allows you to style the buttons and the shape of the field, that kind of style things. And again, as I mentioned in the previous video, once you're happy with your form, you can publish those changes to live. That then gives you um, the ability to go into preview, 
you use the QR code and the, the web form embed code and pop that on your website. And that locks that form now. Um, so it can't be changed. Well, what can't be changed, but by only creating a, um, a safe version of it. Okay, um, I think the only other things that we haven't talked about in this session are in the about tab. Is, is that right? Or is there anything else in Builder that I needed to talk about, Andy? No, pretty much covered everything, I think. Brilliant, okay. So if I just go to about now, there's a couple of little extra things. Um, down the bottom here, you'll notice there's something called locations, notes, changes, full logs, etc. Now, obviously, changes in full logs basically just tells you what's been going on. So it's a really good way of checking to see what changes have been made and also um, perhaps who the form was created by originally, you can see here. Um, but locations is one that might need a bit more explanation. So this is where your form is going to be embedded. So let's say we're happy with our form, we've published it, and now we've got our embed code and we're going to pop it on our website. Once that's been popped on our website, a really good thing to do is to add the location. So in this case, I'm going to say, um, okay, this is going to go to um, our students. This is going on our student CRM page. I hope that's right. I think it might be HTTPS actually. Brilliant. Okay, now that stays there. And basically we can preview it in um, Stay Responsive, which is a nice little um, responsive website um, previewer. But what this also does is when I go to um, my prospectus request app, I click over there and I go to the forms page, you'll see that I can actually now see the form I've built for prospectus requests um, app here. You'll see that the location that I've entered actually shows. And that's a really good way of quickly jumping to where that form is actually hosted on your website. So it's a nice little shortcut to actually get to the form once it's been published. Obviously, if I want to edit my form and actually make changes to it, then I just click on the edit. And while I'm in prospectus request, I just click edit and you'll be see that jumps you straight back into my prospectus request form again. So that's a nice little way of jumping between the app itself and the web form builder set up as well. Um, and then the last thing on the about page to show you is documents. Um, this is basically any document which helps explain your form or perhaps maybe some GDPR documentation that you want to attach, you can just attach to the form. So you just click here, choose a file, give it um, a title, and then that'll be saved in the record for your form. It's got nothing to do with the form itself, but it basically just allows you to capture um, a little bit of uh, documentation about that form. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, every form you create is given an ID at the top here. Um, every time you create a new version of a form, it's given a incremental number here. So obviously I started off with one, I've done two, and this is my third draft, my third version. And so when I publish this, the published version will be ID 14049.03. And actually I might just do that now. I'm gonna say I'm happy. I'm publishing my form. It's all irrevocably update the current form with these changes, click confirm. And there you go, my form is now published and I can go to preview. I can click on use web form, copy that code and then pop that on my website ready to go or just use the URL to open it in a new window. Okay, so that's uh, Web Form Builder and the basics of building forms. Like I said, there's slightly different um, uh, settings and slightly different variations depending on the type of form you're being built. But today covers all of the, um, the fundamental information that you need to build your first form. Um, thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Steph. That was great.